Hello. I've unlocked a new skill I didn't know I had. Well, I kind of always knew I had it, I just never really explored it with the motivation of a community deadline before. One moment. Okay. So I haven't seen you in about a month, and that's because I wrote 61,750 words in November. It's actually December now and I wrote a couple more, but, but the point is I wrote 60,000 words in 30 days. Was that all bad? Hello everyone and welcome back to the Neverland Book Club. Today we will be discussing our November wrap-up as planned, but before we go there, I'd like to thank you all in helping me surpass my NaNoWriMo goal last month, even if I did most of it in secret. We actually filmed the meme review video and I was in the middle of editing it, but just could not find the time or motivation to finish and post it. But that will be up shortly, so be sure to subscribe and click that bell to be notified when it goes up. I will also be releasing an in-depth discussion of the top 10 things I learned while participating in NaNoWriMo, and that should be up next week. So again, subscribe, bell, click. Okay, so there's a lot to go over today and my brain has been a scattered mess because I met Mike Flanagan and Kate Siegel and Henry Thomas and I just won't shut up about it. Very long, long story short, we went to season screamings at the beginning of the month and got a copy of the Midnight Mass and, and got a copy of, of the Midnight Mass, The Art of Horror uh, book. I've mentioned this masterpiece of a show on this channel here before a few times and how much I adore Mike Flanagan as he's adapted some of my favorite Stephen King stories including Gerald's Game and Doctor Sleep. Now obscure relation, I found this book while searching if the show Midnight Mass was ever a novel. It was, but never published. This book, however, is not by Mike. This is Smut. And as you can see here, Mike and his lovely wife Kate signed it. Pablo and I showed them the book and both of them were delighted to see the same title of their project also on the cover of a dirty book. They both signed it without me asking, by the way. They were super chill and so cool about the whole thing and we all had a laugh. <laughs> My new friend. I hope they don't see this and think like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Kate commented on my curly hair, saying she's a curly girl herself, and told us the story of how she and Mike wrote the movie Hush. And I got to ask Mike a question I've been dying to ask anyone who had the experience to answer. What is Stephen King like? To which he said, he's a dirty mouthed big kid. We talked a bit more and it was honestly the highlight of my year. Meeting a hero that makes me one degree of separation from another hero like Stephen King at the end of NaNoWriMo, when I've proven to myself that writing all the novels that are trapped in my head is actually possible somewhat. It's a sign. <laughs> but then the plot thickened on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on Twitter now. Kate posted this. <laughs> I've never mentioned Twitter before, but Kate. Yeah, I've had it since like, I don't know, 2012 or something, but I've just never used it. Anyway, Kate posted this, to which I responded with this, to which Mike himself liked and retweeted within the first five minutes. My throat hurt the next day from screaming, <laughs> but I played it cool. <laughs> okay, that's the gist of the story. We met one of the greatest storytellers of our generation and my mind almost turned to soup in my skull. But you know, whatevs. All right, now let's get on with the regularly scheduled content for the day, November wrap up. I just, I didn't have to tell you all of what I just told you. I just, I can't stop talking about it. And I want to tell everyone that will listen that I met who I met and that he retweeted me. And I'm, anyway, despite writing a poop ton of words this month, I was also able to read quite a bit. I found after writing, it was helpful to read something different and not get too caught up in my head with my own story. So let's dive in. First, I was still in spooky season mode and read, I think it's every time, A Discovery of Witches by Deborah Harkness. This fantasy romance has it all. Witches, vampires, demons, magic, and above all, forbidden love. 
<laughs> this particular copy was sent to me by a viewer and I thank you so much for the gift. It was truly enjoyed. This checked all of the Dark Academia boxes as our main character Diana Bishop and Matthew Claremont are academics at Oxford. When Diana comes across a curious book, her whole world turns upside down as she unwantingly solicits the attention of every supernatural being from far and wide. We travel to the countryside in France in this novel and search the stacks of the Ox Oxford Bodleian Library. Bodleian Library. Yeah, I, thought so. I thought that's what you were trying to say. Whenever I read Bodleian Library, I think Baudelaire, but it's it's the Oxford Bod Bodleian. Bodleian? I'm an intellectual. <laughs> Diana is reborn as a witch in this novel as she suppressed her magic all her life and finds love in an unlikely undead hunk. The story also focuses on historical realism since Diana is a historian and continuously recounts her studies as certain morsels of knowledge become helpful in her journey. I enjoyed this book immensely and definitely intend on reading the others in the series. Four stars. Next, we have Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney. Think you know the person you married? Think again, dot, dot, dot. <gasps> That's the tagline. The gasp is included. This thriller mystery novel was unputdownable. As with other Feeney novels, the twists and turns the story takes can make you dizzy as you try to keep the timeline straight in your head. It's not impossible. It's not that it can't be followed. It's just a fun and enticing puzzle to solve, which makes the reading experience that much more fun. The novel is split up into different timelines, one being a married couple from both husband and wife perspectives as they travel far, far away for a free weekend getaway. The other timeline contains letters written in secrets from wife to husband once a year on their anniversary. It's difficult to describe much more without spoiling anything, so I'll say, if you enjoy being psychologically tortured and slightly scared to the point where you'll likely throw the book when startled, then Rock, Paper, Scissors is for you. This title was also a nominee for the Goodreads Choice Award for Best Mystery and Thriller in 2021. 3.5 stars. After reading that one, I was still on an adrenaline kick and wanted more thrills, so I downloaded Wrong Place, Wrong Time by Gillian McAllister? Gillian? Gillian. Gillian McAllister. Another Goodreads Choice Award nominee for Best Mystery and Thriller for this year, 2022. The tagline, Can You Stop a Murder? The tagline, Can You Stop a Murder After It's Already Happened? Hmm. This was exciting right off the bat. The action starts immediately and I really appreciated that because I was in go mode. Then the murder that is already alluded in the tagline turns and gets things get, it gets complicated and it's fun. The question is answered in this novel, but you'll just have to read it for yourself and find out. So again, like with the previous book, it's difficult not to spoil things with this one, but I'll try to tell you the main premise without giving too much away. The story is told through the perspective of a mother who witnesses her 17-year-old son kill a man. She then wakes up the next morning to find it's the day before, hence the tagline. Time loops, insufferable puzzles, hidden identities, quantum physics, it's all explored in this thriller and I enjoyed the ride. Again, unput downable, 3.5 stars. Pretty on par with rock, paper, scissors. Okay, next I broke up the scary hoo-ha for a little contemporary smooch smooch with The Heart Principle by Helen Huang. You all know how I felt about the kiss quotient. I loved it. And the bride test, also loved it. And you guessed it, I loved this one as well. Huang has such a talent for creating realistic characters you can't help but feel real human emotions for and have to remind yourself constantly as a reader they're only in my head. These are not real people. So strange. The main female character of The Heart Principle is a violinist who happens to have autism, a common thread among Huang novels that I deeply appreciate. The main character decides to try online dating after her longtime boyfriend goes all Ross on her and tells her they should take a break. Not break up, just, just a break. He still wants her, but after he's explored other, other avenues. Yuck. Anyway, she decides, well, if he's gonna go sleep around, then so am I. But of course, she ends up falling in love with the male main character, and their relationship is so organic and realistic and fun and do. This is what I'm here for with a contemporary romance. The slow burn is just the right pace and the inner conflict is present throughout both main characters. Their lives and relationships are built so well they truly feel like real people. I still liked The Kiss Quotient best, but I think I enjoyed this one more than The Bride Test, to be honest. It just felt more relatable, especially with her conflicts with her musical side and her relationship with her family, taking care of her father. It's all just so good. So good. Four stars. Let's start with the disappointments. First, we have One Italian Summer by Rebecca Surly? 
Cyril? Cyril? I wanted to read this to get into that vacationing in Europe mode since the novel I'm currently writing is set in Spain and France and I think I mentioned Italy at some point. Anyway, I was trying to enter that headspace and well, this is not what I had expected. You read the cover of this novel and think, ooh, a contemporary romance of a woman who goes to Italy and maybe has a summer fling with a local who feeds her gelato and rides a Vespa and maybe she gets an Audrey Hepburn pixie cut and lays naked on a nude beach. No. None of that happens. I won't spoil big plot points, but I will bring up certain elements that alter the tone. So if you don't want to know, just skip ahead. So the story actually starts with a funeral. The main character's mother's funeral. And she decides to go to Italy for the summer because she had planned on going with her mother but never got the chance. She leaves her loving, attentive husband at home and goes to a hotel she knows her mother has stayed at before when she was her age now. There she runs into her mother. Young. She time travels somehow? I, I don't know. It's it's all a bit it's all a bit of a stretch. But then she does meet someone. Ooh. But but who is that someone? A dark haired, broody Italian who will feed her and whisper sweet nothings in her ear? No. It's not her father. Ignata <laughs> <laughs> Back to the Future. Oh <laughs> It's a good book. <laughs> No, she meets another American. She travels through time and across an ocean to fall for someone she could have run into down the street from her own home and who is about 30 years older than her in her own timeline. So there's that. I didn't like it. <laughs> I also listened to it and the narrator was the most blah in her presentation. It made me dislike it even more. Two stars. Pretty cool idea, but... Yeah, because I, I was thinking that it was going to give me that headspace. It was going to put me in, like, the environment that I was trying to get into to write my own story. But it was... It was bad. You have this whole setup for something that could be pretty cool. And then I thought, okay, that is cool that she meets her mom and then they're the same age, so they get to bond. And then she finds out about, like, the things that she never knew about her mom and how her mom lived in, in Italy. Not just visited, but lived there. And it's interesting, but then they, in, like, they introduced the guy, and I was like, why, why? Like, if you're gonna make it a story about a mother-daughter love thing, then stick to that. Why are you throwing in this other element, and it's a, dis it's a disappointing love story? Why? All right, more disappointment, but not as bad. <sighs> Funny You Should Ask by Alyssa Sussman. This was another interesting idea executed mediocrely. A journalist's interview with a Hollywood heartthrob turns into a night out, then a party, then a morning after, then years later, another meeting. And the slow burn is so slow it's basically insufferable. The journalist gets famous for this one interview and bases her entire career off of it, which, good for her? If you get an opportunity like that in your career, aren't you supposed to just use it as much as you can? Because she seems to feel a bit guilty for it, which annoyed me. <laughs> All the famous journalists now made their names known after interviewing other famous people. That's how the cycle works. It's the questions you ask, the choices you make with the time you have with these celebrities that might make your interview more memorable than the other hundreds of press events they're liable to go to. Anyway, I digress. Point being, I couldn't really connect with these characters. They didn't seem real in the same way the characters in, say, a Helen Huang book feels, or even Emily Henry's characters. Plus, the spice, when they finally get to it, it was just... You know? And now I feel bad because I specifically got the signed copy. Sorry, Miss Sussman. Two and a half stars. Bit sus. Bit sus, yeah. Last, and a nice pick-me-up after all the disappointment, The Night She Disappeared by Lisa Jeswell. Um, I forgot that this still had this little sticker on it. It says for Nadia because uh, a coworker of mine gave this to me. And I think it's so sweet because apparently this, this co-worker of mine uh, who also reads, her sisters and her mom, they all like ship it to each other, the one book. And she's given me a few others, but this one, it's, it's just sweet. They like ship the one book to each other so they can all share the same copy. I am not like that because I like having my own copy and I like annotate it. Are you supposed to give it back? I asked her, she said no. She said I can either keep it for myself or hand it to someone else. And I haven't, I don't know who to hand it to. <laughs> the Night She Disappeared by Lisa Jewell. I don't know why whenever I, I think Jess well, and it's because I put the S, or maybe because the woman who gave me this, her name is Jess. Jess Will. Thanks, Jess. Lisa Jewell. <laughs> Another nominee for the same blah blah Goodreads blah blah mystery th thriller thriller blah blah 2021. This one was fun. 
but not as fun as Rock, Paper, Scissors or Wrong Place, Wrong Time. I feel like it took too long to get to the mystery, to the thriller. It had that same vibe of the main character finding different puzzle pieces and seeing which fit where while us, as the readers, are just as much in the dark as they are until everything starts to fall into place and make sense rather quickly towards the end of the novel. See, I find that a little frustrating and a little lazy. You build, 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 leaving breadcrumbs for us to follow and then dump the whole thing in some James Bond villain-esque way in the last 50 pages. I'm not super mad because it was still a fun ride, but to me it was just a little too anticlimactic towards the end. We have another story told through the perspective of a mom. When her daughter goes missing, leaving her to take care of her grandchild, she suspects the child's father is the one to blame since He's also missing. But as we follow the conveniently placed breadcrumbs and ask the conveniently rich friends what happened, things start to unravel. The story kind of feels like it was generated by suggestive text. That might be a little mean to say, but it kind of felt too convenient at times. I will say though, one of the puzzle pieces that helps to solve the entire thing was pretty clever. It's an actual piece of something. I did appreciate that element of creativity. So all in all, I still had fun and I'd still recommend reading this title if you're into mystery thriller, which I've been in quite the mood for lately. So three stars, wee. All right, that's all I have for you today, dear viewers. Be sure to like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you're not. My top reads of 2022 will be coming out soon as well as the other aforementioned videos, including my NaNoWriMo journey. Be sure to check us out on Heartbeat, Instagram, and now, Twitter. I found a nice community of writers on Twitter that's actually been quite encouraging, so if you would like to connect, just follow me and I'll follow back. But if you want like direct messages and, and, and more of an interaction, check me out on Heartbeat because that's more of a little community. Everything is, as always, linked down below. Okay, today's shout out goes to Atharva Deshpande. I hope I'm saying your name right. Who commented, really liked the live. Moreover, Julia looks cute and much more bemused in explaining book reviews, to which I responded, Who's Julia? <laughs> to answer your question from this other comment, our lives will return next year. We don't have lives right now. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> like live streams, <laughs> live streams. <laughs> our live streams will return next year. And I was busy writing a dirty book, which is why we didn't post much last month, but stay tuned, click the bell. All right, I'm off to go stare at my signed copies of Midnight Mass, The Art of Horror, as well as Midnight Mass, The Art of Smut. <laughs> Stay lost, keep reading. Meet your Goodreads goals. I'm gonna make sure I'm not stepping on my laptop. Goodbye.